if a tassic. Um, I am going to be talking about um, Manfred today, Byron's really wonderful play, and talking about transness in that. Um, uh, I know um, that this is a very mixed audience. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be keeping a lot of the information fairly general in a way that I hope is accessible to people uh, across disciplines and, and outside of academia and whatever else. Uh, and that also means I'm going to be covering a lot of very broad things very, very quickly. Um, so if there's something that's interesting that you want to talk about uh, more, please uh, you know make a note of it and then we can discuss it afterwards. I unfortunately will not see your, your chat uh, as I'm presenting. So um, do feel free to ask me questions or argue or whatever after the presentation. Um, so uh, just a quick content warning uh, before we jump into things. Uh, there's nothing explicit. There's no explicit images or anything like that. Uh, but this presentation might touch on uh, suicide, transphobia, gender confirming uh, surgery, sexual assault, eating disorders, HIV, AIDS. Um, uh, like I said, not particularly explicit, but, but very likely to be mentioned. So just be aware of that going forward. Um, so yeah, so um, before I actually um, do this sort of reading of Manfred, that's that's uh, this trans reading, I, I do want to talk a little bit about how I approach literature in general um, as a literary scholar, as someone who does transgender work, um, as a transgender person. Um, there's some there's some peculiarities with this text that I think are, are worth talking about. First of all, this is a, a somewhat challenging text to talk about. And if you if you aren't familiar with it, don't worry, we'll we'll do a little um, recap uh, in just a bit. But um, uh, this is a, a weird text. So first of all, this is not one of Byron's more um, popular works critically. Um, it is a, a fairly well known one. It's anthologized a lot. But there's not a ton of scholarship on it rel uh, relative to other Byron works. Uh, you know, it's not a Child Herald or anything. Um, it's a it's a pretty small body of scholarship, and that scholarship is is mostly dominated by a, one particular reading. It, if it's not the the main subject of a piece of criticism, it is um, at least heavily mentioned, and that's this idea that um, Manfred is a play that is about. Uh, Byron's own real life affair with his half sister Augusta Lee. Um, uh, yeah, that is in the play. Um, it's a play that is um, partially about incest, and we'll talk about that. Um, but uh, it's not the only thing that this play does, right? And I, I feel that this reading tends to dominate that conversation so much that it actually gets hard to talk about other things with this play, right? Literature is very multivalent. It can tell us a lot of different things at the same time. So um, we'll touch on the, the incest thing, um, uh, but there are other possibilities here. The other problem is um, uh, because of the nature of this play, like I said, it's it's partially about something in Byron's own life and the nature of Byron as a writer, uh, which is to say he he um, liked to put himself in his work quite a bit. If you read much Byron, you'll probably recognize that, that Byron uh, liked to think of himself as a kind of Byronic figure in his own right, uh, that a lot of Byron work tends to feel autobiographical in some way. And the problem with that is whenever you read a Byron text, that means that it, it also seems to be the case that you're sort of claiming something about Byron himself, right? If Byron's work is this way and his work is commenting on himself, then that must mean our criticism is commenting on Byron. Um, I don't necessarily want to be doing that here. Um, I'm not claiming that Byron is trans. Uh, that's a pet theory of mine, right? Um, maybe it's a, a question we can raise, like what does this uh, reading say about Byron, if anything? But I'm not making an explicit claim about the author here. Uh, the reason this tends to be a problem, though, is that some people are really invested in a certain image of Lord Byron. Um, so I have here a collection of, of just things that I found uh, describing Byron. Uh, this is an image that we tend to have of Lord Byron as a person, right? The sex god, the bad boy, um, the fuck boy, right? Um, like all of this stuff. Uh, this is who we think of as Byron, right? Partially because this is who Byron sort of like um, presented himself as, uh, as his celebrity persona, right? Uh, and this, this sort of comes with some problems uh, if you're doing Byron scholarship. The first is that some people are weirdly defensive of this image. Like they have this uh, image of Byron as this very like masculine, uh, cool bad boy archetype that um, uh, we can, you know, like damage if we criticize it too much. Uh, you can see some, some tweets here that were in reply to me once um, where I had done this sort of trans reading and then people, uh, this person, 
uh, claims that that couldn't be true because he was hung like a horse, um, which is a weird <laughs> thing to say. Um, trans women can be hung like horses, I hate to tell you, uh, but also um, I, don't, I don't know why people are so offended um, by scholarship about Byron. The other problem is, is sort of in the opposite direction where um, Byron is, is such a, a polarizing bad figure, right? That he was abusive, which was true and alcoholic and, and all of these things that are, uh, you know, he's kind of a toxic person to be around in real life. Um, that anything that, that sort of casts Byron as marginalized in any sense gets read as apologia for Byron. Like I'm trying to defend him, right? Um, it is the case that there were some vulnerable parts of Byron, that he was a queer man in an extremely homophobic society, that he was visibly disabled, that he had an eating disorder, that he was sexually abused as a child. Like these things are true, right? And they also don't excuse Byron's real life um, um, awfulness, right? That he, he still was an abusive person. So my point is, uh, whatever criticism we have here, don't think that it has to like alter your image of Byron. Frankly, I don't care what your image of Byron was, right? Um, there's also some problems with doing trans literary scholarship in general, um, right? We're talking about a 19th century person, um, early 19th century, and this is technically before transgender really becomes understood as a term, as an identity, as a diagnosis, whatever, right? And so anytime you make a claim about a character being trans or that something uh, seeming trans in 19th century uh, uh, literature, um, it gets read as um, the sort of ahistorical intrusion, right? And this is doubly the case for trans feminine readings. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, I do 18th century trans feminine readings uh, of, of, of British literature, right? Um, uh, this is a sort of doubly difficult field to work in. There are um, some pretty strong historical cases of trans masculine people. Um, uh, there are much less so for trans feminine people for a variety of cultural reasons. Um, uh, one of which was simply that AMAB people were killed by the government for engaging in queer behavior. Um, sodomy was punishable by death in England all through Byron's life. Um, probably he saw an average of two men a year hanged in his lifetime for the crime of sodomy, right? Um, this is a, a, a statistic coming from Lewis Crompton. Um, so there's reasons that trans feminine people might not exist in the historical record, right? Um, the other problem is that trans misogyny is just rampant in the scholarship itself, uh, like 20th and 21st century scholarship doesn't tend to be very nice to trans people, as it turns out, right? And my example here is the Chevalier Deon. Um, this is Deon here. Um, she was a um, late 18th century figure, so like sort of immediately pre-Byron, which is why she's relevant here. Uh, a late 18th century trans woman, she was a, a celebrity uh, French soldier, diplomat, spy. Uh, she was already famous when she, um, at, in sort of the middle of her life, came out as a woman, right? And this was a, a well-known publicized thing, um, like people bet on what her genitals looked like. Um, Beaumarchais bet on what her genitals looked like, weirdly enough. Um, uh, right. So, and, and the scholarship about her, like written in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, tends to be pretty gross, um, making conjectures about her mental health, about her um, political reasons for transitioning, whatever. Right. Uh, so, the scholarship is not so nice. But if we actually look at her words, what we discover is a pretty interesting model for understanding transness in the late 18th century and early 19th century, uh, namely that her um, memoirs kind of emphasize two things. Things. First of all, dualism, and I mean that in a kind of Cartesian sense, right? We have this body-mind separation that's at work here. Uh, this is a, a major topic in 18th century literature, the idea that we have a sort of internal subjectivity that is not necessarily the same as our external selves, right? That we have a sort of inner soul, a secret self, whatever, and that that isn't necessarily the same person as who we present to the world, right? The other idea that, that uh, Deon talks about is um, um, what I call chirality. In chemistry, chirality refers to uh, molecules that are mirror images, but asymmetrical so that they can't be superimposed. So if you imagine your left and your right hand, they are mirror images, right, uh, typically, but they can't be superimposed because they're opposite, right? Like nothing will make them actually be able to superimpose, right? They're chiral. Uh, and this is what we see in the trans uh, uh, memoir of the time. Uh, Deon emphasizes that she was sort of a person who was at war with herself all of the time. She was a bad boy than a good girl. She was this uh, decorated violent war uh, veteran. 
and she was also this uh, really meek religious woman, that she was both of these kind of um, um, uh, warring things at the same time. Her very existence was chiral, right? Uh, we also see ideas like secrecy and deception, the idea of feeling out of place, the weight of personal history uh, bearing down on you. So keep these things in mind because they will be relevant to uh, uh, Manfred. So, okay. Uh, all of that works as a pretty good introduction to uh, what I do as a scholar. Let's actually jump into the play itself, right? So um, first of all, um, Manfred, if you're not familiar, it is a, a closet drama. That means that it is a play, but it's not actually written to be um, performed on stage. It's actually um, designed to be read or perhaps read aloud in a small group. Um, you can see this in the play. Some of the stage directions are um, utterly useless if you're trying to stage a play, but they're really great as um, drivers of dramatic tension. Um, uh, so uh, this was not meant to be performed. It has been performed. It can be staged, but Byron didn't write it that way. Um, it was written 1816, 1817. This is pretty roughly in the middle of, of Byron's career. Um, if, you, if you know some of Byron's work, this is immediately post um, the poem Darkness. Uh, so a lot of that um, apocalyptic imagery, that really grand sweeping imagery is totally present in Manfred. But this is before things like Don Juan, Child Harold, a lot of his major works. So we're kind of looking at maybe like the early part of, of the like golden age of Manfred right, uh, of, of Byron rather. Um, this was also written, uh, and here's where we get back to that conventional reading I mentioned. Immediately after Byron left England for good, he never returned, uh, to go to Switzerland amid rumors that he had an affair with his half-sister Augusta Lee, uh, which was, you know, uh, not a cool thing to do, not in the 19th century, probably still not now, don't recommend it, but Byron did it, um, right? So this is the context that we find Manfred in. Manfred as a play is um, a, a basically a Faustian tale, so a tale about um, uh, a sorcerer who has like kind of all the knowledge and power in the world. Uh, Faustian tales, if you'll recall, like Goethe's Faust or, or um, uh, Tragical History, Marlowe's Faust, right? Um, it's about a, a a guy who is kind of like cavorting with dark powers in order to gain the things that he wants. Manfred, in this case, uh, has everything he wants except that he lost the love of his life, Mastardi, Astardi, in uh, somewhat mysterious circumstances. That makes him really sad. He can't seem to fix this. So now what he wants is to die. And not just to die, but to have his soul totally like erased from the earth. He doesn't want to go to heaven. He doesn't want to go to hell. He doesn't want to go to an afterlife. He wants to be gone, right? Um, there's a lot of conventional romantic and gothic elements in this text. We have ghosts, we have castles, we have mountains, um, we have forbidden love, we have painful personal histories that always bear down on our protagonist. We have a little bit of blasphemy, just a little dash of blasphemy for flavor. And of course, there's this figure, the doppelganger, right? Um, the doppelganger is a figure, a sort of trope you might be familiar with. Uh, literally, it translates to double walker, like a person's like mirror image person, right? Uh, like you're walking down the street and you see someone that who looks just like you. Um, uh, in folklore, this is kind of a symbol of bad luck. Like if you see a doppelganger, um, something bad's going to happen to you. Um, in the Gothic, this is kind of a, a psychological trope. Uh, it typically symbolizes like um, someone's hidden inner self, uh, like you're harboring really violent fantasies or, or really like um, um, sexually inappropriate fantasies or something hidden within you, perhaps something that you've even repressed from yourself uh, is suddenly out in the open, right? Like out in the world. And the encounter with that is extremely disturbing. So not only are you seeing someone who's just like you, uh, but also they represent something really awful. Uh, this is where we get the idea of the evil twin, right? Like your, your sort of inner primal uh, darkness is now out in the world. Um, and, and of course, twins are just... Um, spooky in in media like that's a kind of idea we have a lot we have those creepy twins in the shining right like it's a thing uh so so doubles of people are are weird and creepy is the idea right manfred actually does not explicitly contain a doppelganger it's not like there's a double manfred walking around uh but let's let's look at how manfred actually describes his lost lover astarte um so I've just got some quotes here. I'll just, I'll just read some and, and give some context to some of these quotes. Uh, and all of these are in Manfred's own words. 
um, uh, I say tis blood, my blood, the pure worm stream, which ran in the veins of my fathers and in ours when we were in our youth and had one heart. Um, she was like me in lineaments, her eyes, her hair, her features, all to the very tone, even of her voice, they said, were like to mine, but softened all and tempered into beauty. She had the same lone thoughts and wanderings, the quest of hidden knowledge and a mind to comprehend the universe. Literally, she looked and acted just like me, but, and this is critical, better because she's feminine, right? That's the, that's the critical difference that Manfred finds, is Astarte is exactly like me, but better because she's feminine. Uh, so keep that in mind that that's how Manfred feels about her. But also, I loved her and destroyed her, not with my hand, but heart, which broke her heart. It gazed on mine and withered. I have shed blood, but not hers, and yet her blood was shed. So we have a sense of like bodies getting confused with one another, right? Which heart was broken? Who shed blood? And how was that blood shed? And, and right, like all of these things are, are now getting mixed together as though Manfred and Astarte, their hearts, their blood, their bodies could be easily confused with one another. Even in Manfred's own mind, he can't keep this quite straight, right? This, this passage doesn't quite make sense to us. Uh, so here's Astarte um, kind of acting as a doppelganger. She's just like Manfred, and her memory uh, haunts him quite a bit, right? She's like a, a, an internal doppelganger. Um, but weirdly, uh, for as much as this play is about um, Manfred's problems having lost his, his uh, girlfriend slash sister, um, the play doesn't actually talk about Astarte all that much. Manfred spends most of his time talking about himself and how he feels about his body and his role in society, right? So let me read a, a couple more quotes. Uh, and unless I specify again, these are all from Manfred himself. Uh, in my heart, there's a vigil and these eyes but close to look within. And yet I live and bear, uh, uh, live and bear the aspect and form of breathing men. Uh, literally, I, I feel dead. Uh, I'm clearly I'm alive. I look alive like a living person, but I feel dead, right? Um, and here he is speaking to the spirit of air he's just summoned. The lightning of my being shall not yield to yours, though cooped in clay. Literally, I'm a mortal form. I'm like an Edenic uh, son of the earth, um, but I, I am as bold as any spirit, right? Uh, the barrenness of my spirit. This is a really important quote, so pay attention to this one. This barrenness of spirit and to be my own soul's sepulcher. So literally, like my soul is, is sort of uh, deficient or non-existent. I don't have a soul. Uh, uh, or it's dead, right? And my body is like a tomb. It's like my body is a tomb for my soul. Uh, that's a significant description here. So just keep that in mind. Um, and we see more and more, um, right? Um, uh, my joy was in the wilderness. I had no sympathy with breathing flesh. Uh, we have a spirit here describing Manfred as, um, uh, it's kind of a shame that he was born a human. Uh, should he have been a spirit, he would have been an awful one. In terms of awe inspiring, he would have been a really great spirit right? Um, the abbot, this priest that comes to visit him, mentions that he will not pry into thy secret soul. So literally, we have a reference here to this idea of dualism or chi chirality, right? That Manfred has a secret soul, something within him that is different than what is presented on the outside. Uh, and, and Manuel, his servant here, uh, I, served, I served his father whom he not resembles. So Manfred uh, is explicitly not at all like his father, right? Um, you might be starting to notice a pattern here. There's a lot of gendered terms at work. Um, actually, Manfred's world is, is extremely binary. There is a masculine humanity and there is a feminine spiritual wilderness. And these things are often pitted against one another. Manfred's power uh, really comes from being able to bridge these things, uh, but he's not really comfortable with where he sits on the binary, right? So just, just look at some of these, right? So first of all, a spirit he summons tells him, um, uh, we answered as we answered our replies, even in thine own words, like we take on your voice to answer you. Thine essence be as ours, right? Like literally, uh, uh, yours and my essence are kind of the same. Uh, and um, here's a, a really fun quote from that same scene. So in this scene, this is early in the play, Manfred has um, summoned a bunch of spirits. Um, and uh, for the time being, they appear as like points of light on stage. They're just like stars and then disembodied voices. Manfred wants to request something of them, but first he wants to look the spirits in the eye, like actually look upon their form and, and demand something of them. So this is what Manfred says, and I've emphasized the important part here. Let him, 
uh, so the spirit, let him who is most powerful of ye take such aspect as unto him may seem most fitting, right? So take on the form that seems best for you. And then the spirit appears in the shape of a beautiful female figure and says, behold, right? And Manfred is horrified. Like he goes ashen, he's shocked. He thinks the spirits are making fun of him, right? This difference in gender that Manfred has misgendered a spirit is um, important to pay attention to, right? And again, on and on and on this goes. To the Witch of the Alps, he says, beautiful spirit in whose form the charms of earth's least mortal daughters grow. I read that thou will pardon to a son of earth, right? So least mortal daughters um, of kind of being like the spirits or nature. Uh, and then uh, Manfred himself, the son of earth, right? Uh, who feels he needs a pardon, who feels really distraught. Um, Manfred again, my spirit walked not with the souls of men, nor looked upon the earth with human eyes. Um, the abbot asks him why he doesn't live and act with other men. And Manfred says, because my nature was averse from life. So we get, uh, first of all, you know, we might be inclined to read this as, as man, as kind of just a gender neutral humanity. Uh, but again, Manfred does think about gender pretty heavily, right? Uh, that difference with Astarte being feminine matters to him. Earth is constantly described as feminine. Spirits are constantly feminine. This is significant, right? Uh, so we know that Manfred is averse to acting like a man, right? He tells us that explicitly. He is not like other men. Um, uh, okay, so where does this take us then? Hopefully I've convinced you by now that this is in some sense a gothic tale about the gender binary, right? So Manfred is haunted by a doppelganger. He's constantly haunted by the memory of a Stardi who looks just like him, except better because she's a girl, right? Uh, and this represents a division within himself. Something about this gender binary is really painful. Uh, he is an ostensibly masculine human. Uh, people describe him as masculine. Uh, who is actually more akin to the feminine spirits of the wilderness. Literally, the spirits say he's actually more like them than he is like a man, right? Uh, so what happens when this binary collapses? What happens when Manfred has to confront himself? And if you'll recall, I asked you to remember that description where Manfred says that his body is like a tomb for his own soul uh, and that his soul is also kind of non-existent, right? So his body is like a tomb for his spirit. Uh, Manfred is the sepulchral being, he's tomb-like, who feels oddly soulless. And here's what happens. He um, marches into the hall of the uh, ultimate ancient evil, Aramanus, uh, the ancient evil of, of the religion Zoroastrianism. Manfred just like strolls into this dude's court, which I guess is a thing uh, when you're powerful enough, you can do. And Aramanus, uh, you know, like respects the game and just is like, all right, what do you want then? Like, if you can get here, you must be powerful enough to request something from me. Uh, so Manfred asks him to, um, at least temporarily, resurrect Astarte so I can talk to her, um, right? So uh, uh, Aramanus asks him, uh, um, literally, who would you have me uncharnel? Who would you have me unbury? What dead person do you want me to rise from their tomb? And Manfred replies, one who has no tomb, that Astarte is literally um, a dead person um, without a tomb, potentially without a body at all, right? Um, this is a, a significant description because again Manfred is the tomb without a spirit and Astarte is the spirit without a tomb right we have to understand that that chirality is heavenly at work here and also that Manfred sort of um understands Astarte as being part of him as being internal to him right that she's the spirit without a tomb she belongs in his tomb without a spirit right um, and so here's where we get the scene where finally Manfred sees Astarte face to face. And I am uh, uh, being rather roguish and using these Lacanian terms, not in a Lacanian way. So uh, sorry if you're really into theory. Um, uh, this mirror stage, um, uh, I'm using um, after Jay Prosser. Jay Prosser is, um, uh, wow, the sun is really shining in on me, isn't it? Um, Jay Prosser is a, um, a transmasculine theorist. Um, he wrote a book in the 90s called Second Skins, which was about um, transgender memoir. Memoir tends to be a, a pretty important uh, genre for trans people. It's a really common genre for trans people to write in. Uh, and so Jay Prosser was interested in uh, examining what it is that transgender memoir does, what are its hallmarks. And one of the things he noticed is that a lot of trans people in their memoirs uh, write in a scene in which they have to confront their own image in the mirror. So this will usually be a transgender person who is um, pre-transition and they look at their image, the one that causes them so much pain, right? So like a trans woman would be looking at her masculine self-image and feeling a, a lot of dysphoria over this. 
Uh, and also that this mirror, uh, this mirror stage um, uh, foregrounds surgical intervention. So often in these memoirs, um, the, the trans person in, in question gets bottom surgery, you know, they get vaginoplasty or something, uh, and therefore their body is made whole and healthy for them, right? So this mirror stage um, foregrounds that. You're looking at literally a fragmented self, uh, two images looking at one another. And then later in the text, those two images are merged. They be, they're, they're cut apart, they're reassembled into something that is coherent and whole instead of a self that is, as Dayan was, at war with itself, right? So keep that in mind, uh, literally, and you can see this lovely image from a, a 20s edition of Manfred, um, uh, literally Manfred, the dark figure here, uh, mirroring the posture uh, of, of Astarte, this white ghost right here, uh, right? So there's a kind of mirror imagery at work as Manfred comes face to face with Astarte uh, and attempts to do something, right? So what happens here is Astarte is, is risen from the grave um, but she's oddly not able to speak much, um, and, and Aramanus himself is not sure why uh, this isn't the case, uh, that she can't speak, um, and he, he just kind of shrugs, and, you know, he's like, I, I don't, I can't really control that, unfortunately. Um, so what happens is Manfred, uh, looking at the ghost of Astarte, and I, I don't, with the sun shining, I'm not going to, not sure you're going to be able to see this, but we'll try. Um, Manfred constantly implores Astarte to speak to him, say something to me. But then Manfred immediately um, starts speaking himself. So literally we have up at the front, up at the top here, Manfred is like a starty, speak to me, say something. And then instantly launches into, you can see this is all Manfred's speech, this page long monologue. So a starty speak, and then immediately launches into his own monologue, which is sort of funny and narcissistic, uh, except it might also suggest that Manfred is literally trying to speak for Astarte, as though he can command her to speak and then take on her voice for himself, right? Astarte speak, and then he starts speaking as though in doing so, he might finally have Astarte's voice, right? Because again, she is the uncharneled spirit. He is the sepulchral uh, 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 barrenness of spirit. They belong as one being is the idea, right? Um, I've also extended this idea of the mirror stage uh, through Prosser to the idea of cutting. Um, remember that we are dealing with a play. We have scene transitions, right? Scene transitions uh, typically for us as readers or viewers of a play um, indicate that there's about to be some kind of change, right? A change in time, a change in setting, uh, and probably a change in character, right? They literally drive narrative forward. That's the case here as well. So immediately after Manfred um, confronts Astarte uh, and tries to do this, this technique where he like takes her into himself, right? Tries to speak for her. Uh, what happens is Astarte finally finds her voice apparently and tells him it's all going to end tomorrow. We have this um, hideous like uh, prophecy. And then um, uh, Manfred swoons. He literally faints. Um, and, and that's kind of where the scene ends. Right, so we're led to believe some some things. Right, if we understand this as kind of mirrored in Prosser's sense, uh, we might expect that there's a kind of cutting and reassembling that goes on. Um, maybe a Manfred will have a successful transition. Except again, this is 1816, so we know that's probably not going to happen. Right. Um, or maybe something else happens, right? We know Manfred's going to die, so we have this kind of tension and something's being moved forward. Uh, well, here's the problem. Spoiler alert, Manfred does die, um, like a scene later, or like a like an act later, right? Um, so we'll talk about his death scene in just a second, but first of all, we have to understand what queer death does in media in general, right? So um, again, if we're understanding Manfred as a queer character, then this is queer death, right? Um, you're probably familiar with, with media in which a queer person dies. You've probably seen like bury your gaze tropes or whatever. Um, you've probably, um, I don't know. I mean, this is like a really common thing to happen in media, right? The queer person dies. Um, or they get taken care of in some way. And this is kind of what I'm, I'm gesturing to here with queer death. Um, I would argue that in uh, most mainstream texts, um, queer figures are um, threatening in some kind of way, uh, that mainstream audiences are not comfortable seeing queer characters, right? Um, if you've watched like any sitcom, um, you know, over the past like 20 years or something, you've probably seen like sassy gay characters who nevertheless never get any romantic action, uh, right? They never have sex with anyone. Uh, they just exist 
for the benefit of, of cisgender heterosexual characters, right? Um, so their threat is taken care of because they're, they're never given any sort of queer life, right? It's the same thing with death. When a queer character dies, it ameliorates the threat that the queer person um, um, suggested, right? And my examples, uh, first of all, uh, Angel from Rent, if you've seen um, any of the adaptations of Rent or the original Rent, um, Angel is um, uh, a, a young street queen um, she's of ambiguous gender. Um, in the original, I believe she's a drag queen who uses she, her pronouns pretty often. Uh, in further adaptations, she's been a trans woman. She's been a gender fluid person. The point is her gender is sort of hard to read and she never really gives us good clues as to what it is. Uh, and that I argue uh, is sort of threatening to the audience. Rent is not a particularly subversive text. Uh, if you've seen it, you know, it, it's, it's fine, <laughs> uh, right? But Angel dies, right? She has this little romantic moment and it's cute, um, but then she dies, right? She doesn't actually get to perpetuate or continue her queer life, right? And what happens is sort of doubly insulting. Angel literally comes back as an angel, go figure, uh, right? Mimi, uh, one of the other characters, uh, one of the other plays character, uh, central characters uh, is also dying and she sees a vision of Angel appear to her and Angel says, no, don't, you, it's not your time, go back, don't go to the light, you know? And then uh, Mimi wakes up and she gets together with Roger. So the central heterosexual couple in the in in Rent is saved uh, because of Angel who doesn't actually get her own queer life, right? Um, uh, and I have another kind of odd reference here, which is um, the 1611 play, The Roaring Girl. If you've ever read The Roaring Girl, um, it has this character, Maul Cutpurse, who again is a street queen of ambiguous gender. Um, this kind of like really uh, transmasculine figure, Maul Cutpurse. And the plot of, of The Roaring Girl is that Sebastian wants to marry a woman named Mary Fitzallard. Uh, his father is against it. And so what Sebastian does is pretend to marry Mall cut purse who um, is is uh, queer and filthy and sort of criminal and whatever. Uh, Sebastian's father is horrified, and then Sebastian uh, reveals at the end, oh, "I'm not actually going to marry Mall, uh, right?" And his father's so relieved that he lets him marry Mary Fitzallard instead. Yay! Once again, heterosexuality is preserved. Uh, and meanwhile, Mall cut purse literally like turns to the audience and says, "Don't worry, I don't plan on getting married, right? Like I don't have a queer life of my own." Uh, I just exist for the benefit of these heterosexual, these non-queer characters, right? So again, queer death in media, we don't have to necessarily have literal death, uh, but um, uh, the queer threat has to be ameliorated somehow. It has to be prevented, right? Queer characters cannot have a life after the text. They can't reproduce their queerness. That would be too frightening, right? Um, so that's what we should expect going into Manfred's death. We know he's going to die. Astarte uh, prophesized it, right? Um, uh, Manfred really does ex set us up for what seems like a conventional ending. If you know any other Faustian tales, you know that there's two conventional endings for a Faustian tale. Either uh, the Faustian figure is convinced to um, repent for his sins and he goes to heaven, or he doesn't do that because he thinks it's too late and he goes to hell and therefore gets the punishment he deserves. These are really the only two endings Faustian figures get, right? Um, so Manfred uh, sets us up to expect that. And Abbott comes in, uh, by the way, I don't know why Manfred's dying now. He just is, I don't know, who cares? That's what Byron wrote. He's just dying now. Um, and Abbott comes, um, he's begging Manfred, like repent, it's not too late. It's not too late, you can repent, you can go to heaven, right? Um, Manfred does the Faustian thing. He says, no, it's too late. I've had too many sins to repent. I can't possibly do that, right? Uh, so this is the, the conventional ending we're, we're expecting. Uh, but remember the sort of mirror and cut thing uh, that what we should really be expecting is a transition, but that's not happening either, right? So there's this kind of tension, like nothing's fitting into place in the right ways, right? Uh, and so what happens is uh, all these angels and demons um, surround Manfred's deathbed. Like he can see them. The abbot, I guess, can see them too. Uh, and Manfred says, be gone. He banishes them and then they disappear. And it's just Manfred and the abbot. And Manfred in his dying breath proclaims, "'Tis not so difficult to die. And then indeed does, right? And the abbot is horrified because he just watched this man banish all the angels and demons, the figures that were supposed to shepherd him off to his proper ending. And now the big question is, what happened to Manfred, right? And the abbot actually says, I dread to think where his soul has gone, 
Uh, it didn't end up in heaven. It didn't end up in hell. He has somehow escaped the typical Faustian ending, right? So this is weird. And this is this is where the play ends, like right here, like Manfred just dies. The abbot's like, that's pretty scary. And then uh, finito, right? Like it's over. Um, that's weird. What do we do with that is the question. Well, my argument here, uh, again, if we're reading Manfred as this uh, transgender figure, this queer figure, uh, that Manfred has successfully resisted cis heteronormativity in death, right? This constant gesture to Manfred's spirit-like qualities, the appearance of the ghost of Astarte, the inability to locate his soul afterwards, right? It suggests to us that there is a kind of haunting going on after the ending, that literally the idea of Manfred is somehow haunting us because he hasn't been put in his proper place, right? Uh, if he hasn't been resolved, then it's unresolved. It's a tension that we will constantly feel forever, right? So we have to understand Manfred's death as triumphant, that he has successfully subverted the, the Christian norms that he's been expected uh, to uphold, that he has not acted in service of, you know, like um, cis heterosexual bliss, as all these other queer characters ha have done, right? That Manfred has instead um, up upset the status quo and really disturbed everyone around him as he did through his whole life, right? So even in death, he did not stop um, um, upsetting norms, right? Uh, and indeed, I think this is actually what Byron intended. In the first edition of Manfred, when it was published, um, his publisher had um, excised by, uh, Manfred's final line, that is not so difficult to die, that was left out. And Manfred, uh, sorry, I'm getting them confused now. Byron was furious about this. He actually wrote to his publisher and said, um, uh, by um, removing that line, you've destroyed the whole effect and moral of the poem. The moral of the poem lies in Manfred um, uh, saying, "'Tis not so difficult to die," and then uh, you know, getting yeeted off the mortal plane into God knows where. Like that's the moral, according to Byron, right? Uh, so literally, that he successfully resisted these norms is what Byron intended with the play, right? So again, if we just sort of recap the entire thing, we have this dude who feels really uncomfortable in his body. He's constantly haunted by the image of a woman who just looks just like him, except better because she's feminine. Uh, he attempts to uh, reconcile those two images and fails. Uh, and therefore uh, chooses to die in such a way that it will forever haunt uh, everyone who ever thinks of him, right? And you'll notice that the image I've included here is uh, an ACT UP activist, right? If I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA, right? This this idea of, of um, uh, queer resistance that, that continues on after death, that queer death can do things for the queer community uh, long after we're gone, right? Um, so uh, we have to ask ourselves, so what, right? Am I just um, reading these things into Manfred? Is this just sort of a gimmick reading? Uh, is this a very presentist reading and we could do this to, to anything? I don't think so. I think this is partially what Byron intended. First of all, we have to understand that Gothic and Romantic literature was never neutral, right? That at this very time, this is immediately pre-Victorian years, right? Um, that England was ramping up to be the largest empire on earth, that it was exporting its, its culture everywhere, often quite violently, right? And that included its gender norms, right? This idea of a, of a biological, natural gender binary uh, was being violently enforced on, on um, indigenous people whose own gender systems were being destroyed, right? Um, uh, so this is what's happening in Byron's own time, right? Um, by, by resisting that, uh, Byron makes a really interesting gesture because he, in some small way, and, and again, we can't uh, apologize for everything Byron's done. He's still a white Orientalist dude, right? Um, that he has in some way uh, resisted this uh, colonial gesture, right? Um, also, we have to understand that this literary tradition, Gothic specifically, is intimately bound up with the medicalization of transness. Um, so in the 20th century, um, when we think of trans medicine, we have to think of people like Harry Benjamin, for whom the WPAP standards are named, uh, standards which are still used in transgender healthcare. We have to think of people like Magnus Hirschfeld. Uh, and then if we're thinking of those people, we also have to go back to Sigmund Freud, Havelock Ellis, right? These figures who were um, directly influenced by the Gothic, 
right? Sigmund Freud, uh, writing about the uncanny, uh, basically uh, wrote like the best uh, piece of Gothic criticism ever written, right? Havelock Ellis directly names Byron in his theory of sexual inversion. So when we're talking about um, transgender medicalization, some of which has been quite harmful to transgender people, right? We're talking about like diagnoses um, that have done a lot of damage to um, all trans people, but especially to, uh, you'll notice I have uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera here, uh, to, to trans women of color, right? So um, literally the stuff that, that uh, Byron is talking about and resisting here uh, has been used to harm trans people in the 20th and 21st century. So um, uh, Byron's uh, little act of resistance, as, as fun as it is to think of it as a kind of presentist cutesy reading, I think was actually meant as a literal act of queer resistance in its own time, right? Uh, it's, it's literally an early model of what queer resistance is. Uh, and that's why I think this matters, that it's not just, um, you know, doing trans reading for the hell of it as, as much as I think that has value too. It's, it's that we have to understand that this tradition uh, is still in the air, that we are still beholden to some of these norms, and that by understanding where the cracks in those foundations are, we can hopefully start to maybe widen some of those cracks. Um, yeah, so that is um, a Manfred, everybody. Um, uh, at this point, um, I think we can open it up to, to questions and discussion arguments.